محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب قلوبنا بالقاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميامين المعصومين من يومنا هذا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وخطابه المتين وهو أصدق القائلين وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى سلوات Verily this Quran guides towards that which is most upright. Verily this Quran guides us towards the infallible Imams who are a manifestation of the realities of the Quran. Their life, their sacrifices prove to us that they sacrificed all they had for the uplift and revival of the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet and Islam. Right from the first Imam all the way to the twelfth Imam. One of the prime responsibilities of the Imams that they inherited from all the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar. Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munkar commanding towards good and forbidding, prohibiting, stopping the evil was one of the objectives of all the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the Prophets of Allah without exclusion. The holy verse of the Holy Quran says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا Verily we sent a Prophet in every nation and اعبدوا الله that they should worship Allah وَجْتَنِبُ الْتَاغُوتِ And they should stay away from the Taghut. Commanding towards the worship of Allah is commanding towards the biggest ma'roof. And watch the Nibut Taghut, staying away from the Taghut, is forbidding from the biggest munkar. These ma biggest ma'roof and munkars have been identified, have been mentioned in the Holy Quran, and beneath it, you'll have all the list of the ma'roofs. For if this ma'roof, Ni'budullah, falls apart, nothing will remain. And if the biggest munkar comes in action, takes over the society, if the society is taken over by a ta'ut, then again everything falls apart. That is why you find these two statements side by side in the Holy Quran. A ta'at of Allah and staying away from the ta'ut. Because as we mentioned in the previous days, the essence of ibadat, the essence of worship, is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is through obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is worshipped. There's a beautiful tradition which says, Man ata'a rajulan fi ma'asiyatin faqad abada. Whoever obeys a person in sin has worshipped him. So the essence of worship is obedience. 
Allah will be worshipped which is the purpose of our creation through obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obedience to Allah cannot happen if we side with the Taghut if we side with those who are against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do not who have transgressed the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then worship of Allah cannot take place so one of the prime conditions one of the prime requirements for worship of Allah to take place is the removal of Taghut from all realms of our existence the Taghut that sits within us the Taghut that sits outside of us that was one of the prime responsibilities of all the prophets and this responsibility was inherited by all the Imams and they fulfilled those responsibilities in their times using whatever strategies were important we, feel, we see and this responsibility of Amr bil Maruf and Nahid al Munkar also falls on our shoulders as Mumineen it doesn't stop there one level a certain level certain lower levels of this responsibility falls on all of our shoulders and this responsibility will only be possible if we have authority over each other if we have vilayat over each other if we have if we give each other this right that other mu'minins can stop us from evil and command us towards good deeds the holy quran says wal mu'minuna wal mu'minat ba'zuhum awliya u ba'z mu'minin and mu'minat some of them are the awliya of others ya'muruna bil ma'ruf wa yanhawna 'anil munkar the command towards good and stop from evil this is a responsibility that is entrusted to all of us especially our youth when you make friends your friends should be such that who should inform you of your defects who should invite you towards good and stop you from evil it is through friends that your salvation or damnation is also determined you find this verse in the holy quran that on the day of judgment a person will bite his hand and say i wish i did not take this person as my friend friends often will be the reason why people will end up in hell so when you choose your friends, be careful in whom you choose your friend. Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam. He mentions, he says, do not take an ahmak person as your friend. Do not take a foolish person as your friend. Why? Because he will try to help you, but end up hurting you. He will try to help you but end up hurting you. Do not take a bakhil person as your friend. Do not take a miser as your friend. Why? Because when you will need him the most, he will stay away from you. When you will need him the most, he will stay away from you. Do not make a fasik person your friend. Person who does not respect the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who openly sins why? because he will result in you losing your honor and finally he said do not take a kazaab person a serial liar as your friend a person who is used to lying why? because he will make the distant seem near and the near seem far he will make you think this is simple, it's easy, you sh it's, it's within reach and you will go after it, whatever targets you set and in the end you will see that it was not achievable or accomplishable. So be careful in whom you choose as your friends and give them the right and encourage them to tell you your defects. It is easy for us to find out faults in others. It's difficult to find faults in your own selves. So your friend, if he can inform you of your faults he's one of your best friends Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam says ahabbu ikhwani ilayya man ahda ilayya ayubi my favorite 
Brother, for me, is one who informs me, who gifts me my defects. So if a person informs you of your defects, he's one of your best friends. And another tradition says, Al Momin Mir'atun li Akhihil Momin. A moment is like a mirror to another moment. What does a mirror do when you go in front of the mirror? It shows you your true self. It does not change anything. If you are well dressed, that is how it will present you. Give you back your image. So a moment is one that does that gitch tells you what you are, your faults and your virtues. And another thing, when you move away from the mirror and somebody else comes in front of the mirror, it does not disclose to this new person the faults of the previous person. So we should not tell faults of one to the other. Zaghibat is not allowed. But it is our responsibility to inform our moment brothers and sisters of the faults that we all have. Because it is through this that we will be able to get rid of these faults. So Amr bil Maruf, Nahi Anil Munkar depends on Vilayat, each of us having Vilayat over each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Mu'mineen this Vilayat. And this has conditions to recognize where Amr bil Maruf needs to be done and where it should not be done. If one does not know what a Maruf is and what a Munkar is, one should not delve in that command at that time if you do not know it is also important to know the outcome of amar bil maruf and nahi anil munkar if you feel or if you know that my commanding will make the other person more stubborn then it is wajib not to do it when hazrat musa والسلام, and harun were sent to fir'aun what does the Holy Quran says? فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Talk to them politely. لَأَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرْ أَوْ يَخْشَى Maybe they might be reminded or they might fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So talk to them politely. He is the one who had transgressed but when two of the prophets of Allah were being sent they were sent to them with the message that talk to them with politeness. So Amar al-Maruf, one of the great responsibilities manifested by Imam Hussain in his entire movement. We see that from day one till the end, he was doing Amar al-Maruf. And not only Imam Hussain, all of the Imams will be involved in this divine task. Even the twelfth Imam when he will repair. Please recite the salawat for the twelfth Imam. <laughs> Even when the 12th Imam, he will appear, one of the prime responsibilities would be Amr bil Maruf, Wanhi Anil Munkar. The reappearance of the 12th Imam, Shaitan has played with this important concept of intizar, of zuhur. All of us are waiting for the 12th Imam. One of the signs of the Holy Prophet mentioned in the previous books was that he would be doing Amr bil Maruf and Nahi Anil Munkar and the previous nations, the, the Jews and the Christians and the other nations knew the Holy Prophet through these virtues of the Holy Prophet. They were waiting for the Holy Prophet. But when the Holy Prophet came, what happened? The Jews in Medina who had settled in Medina, why did they settle in Medina? Because they had learnt in their books that the Prophet in the final days will come from this region. So they migrated from their places and settled in Medina. And in Medina there were two other tribes of Mushrikeen, Aus and Khazraj. And they would always, because they were uncivilized, they would always fight each other and they were involved in battles and, and killing. And these Jews who considered themselves to be civilized, they would talk to them and say, we are waiting for our final messenger. And when he comes, we will bring Iman on him, we will believe in him, and with him we will fight you. 
because you are mushrikeen. So they were waiting for the 12th Imam, for their final messenger. But when the messenger came, the Aws and the Khazraj were the first ones to believe in them. They were the first ones to believe in the Holy Prophet. And the Jews who were waiting for the Holy Prophet, they rejected him. Except those who saw the truth and were pure enough and they accepted truth and became one of the companions of the Holy Prophet. But the majority of them rejected. This has happened once back in history. It can happen again. It did happen in Karbala again. The people of Kufa invited Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam, saying that we are ready for you. Our swords are with you. Come, we don't have an Imam. Come and, we, and lead us. And in their letters, they had this statement, Al-Ajal, Al-Ajal, Yabna Rasulillah. They were calling the Imam with these titles. But when the Imam came, how many of them ended up supporting the Imam? What happened? What was the reason? Was it the love of the dunya? Was it the love of wealth? Or fear of loss of property? Or the loss of life? Those fears still exist today. Our sixth Imam says, is our kharaj al qaim when our twelfth will reappear? Kharaja min hazal amr man kana yara an nahu min ahlihi. When the twelfth will reappear, a lot of those who think that they belong to this clan will exit this clan. Wadakhala fihe shibha abadate shamse wal kamar. And the likes of the worshippers of the sun and moon will enter his movement. This is the fear that awaits all of us. When the twelfth Imam is going to come, a lot of the Mu'mineen who consider them as the followers and were praying for his reappearance would leave him. And a lot of those who worship the sun and moon and the likes of them, they will enter his movement. We need to be careful and prepare ourselves. We generally wait for the zuhur of our 12th Imam. But if you look at traditions, you don't find the word of zuhur. The word you find in the traditions, the, uh, the companions would come to the Imam and say, they would ask, Matal Qiyam, when is the uprising? That is the or Matal Faraj, when is the opening? They didn't ask about zuhur as much. Why are we waiting for the zuhur? A person, one of the companions of the Imam came to the Imam and he said, Matal Faraj, when is the opening coming to come? Gusaish, Gustaresh, Hame Rahati kab milegi? Look at the response the Imam gives. He says, Wa anta mimman, mimman yuri to dunya. Are you one of those who want the dunya? Gusaish kab milegi, halat kab thik honge? And the Imam is responding, Are you one of those who like the dunya? Who want the dunya? So if you're waiting for zuhur so that we can have a good life, that is not what the Imam intends from this concept of intizar, of zuhur. Then the Imam tells him, he says that whoever knows this affair, man arafa hazal amr faqad furrija anhu li intizarihi. Whoever is aware of this Amr, of this Amr of Zuhur, of Qiyam, for him, the Faraj has happened because of his intizar. It has happened. He doesn't need to wait. The fact that you are waiting for the Imam implies that you have that Gusha'ish, you have that opening. So if we are, if we understand the mission of Imam Hussain if you understand the mission of the 12th Imam when he will come what is it that he will accomplish he is going to establish justice over the entire world so when we are waiting for him we need to be preparing for that establishment of justice we need to begin by establishing justice over our own souls 
and then our families and then our societies if we start working in that direction we will every moment feel his need a person came to the to an alim and asked him he said i want to meet the imam i want to do the ziyarat of the imam can you tell me one one nuskha one wazifa and the imam and that scholar said yes i can it's very simple actually he said what is it that i need to do he said you need to go and eat fish and and, and chicken and all of these muragan oily foods but do not drink water do not drink water and come to me tomorrow and i will tell you how to do the ziyarat of your imam so he went and he said this is a simple task and he did that and but he had to abstain from water he did, he abstained from water and when he slept and he woke up the next day he came to him and he said now tell me how to meet my imam and he said so what did you do what i asked you to do and he said yes he said so what did you dream about he said i dreamt about the about the ocean i dreamt about water because that is what i was in need of and he said this is the key to the ziyarat of your imam if your being is in need of the imam your ziyarat will be fulfilled your ziyarat will be fulfilled if you begin to start establishing justice over your own selves your own families your own societies you will immediately realize that you cannot accomplish this to the fullest extent you will call your imam and you will remember your imam every moment we will remember our imam every moment we will need feel his need we will feel that he is missing because what we want to accomplish cannot be fulfilled unless he is there that is intezar when you invite someone over dinner and you wait for him you don't start cooking when he comes you don't set up the table when he arrives everything is ready all that you need to do is ready and you and then you are waiting for him a person who is sick but does not consult the doctor and says i'm waiting for shifa is lying he's waiting for his death the person who takes his medicine can claim i'm waiting for my shifa so the concept of intezar shaitan has tempered it and changed it into passive intezar as opposed to active intezar one of the things that shaitan does and we have reference to that in the, in the holy quran a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem thumma la'atiyannahum min bayni aydihim wa min bayni khalfihim wa an aymanihim wa an shama'ilihim wa la tajidu aktharahum shakirin when the dialogue between god and shaitan took place shaitan threatened to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying thumma la'atiyannahum min bayni aydihim i will come to mankind from its front and from its back and from his right hand side and from his left hand side wala tajidu wala tajidu aktharahum shakirin and you will not find the majority of them to be shakirin to be thankful so i'm going to deceive them from four different ways what are these four different ways that shaitan is going to deceive us shaitan being our biggest enemy in the shaitan lakum aduwwum mubin in other places it says in the shaitan lil insan aduwwum mubin fattakhiz in other places fattakhizuhu aduwwan Shaitan has been declared as our manifest enemy and shaitan says i'm going to use these four methods to deceive humanity and this shaitan is someone who who sees us and we cannot see him who has certain powers he can 
and do waswas to us. He can whisper. We don't see we every child that we have, he has two children. So he was blessed because of the six thousand years worship that he has done. And look at his life span. How old is Shaitan? How many years? So he was there from Hazrat Adam wasalam. And not only that, according to some traditions, the reward that he got was because of six thousand years of worship before Hazrat Adam. And in Nahjul Balagha, Imam Al-Satawasalam says that it is not known if those 6,000 years belong to 6,000 years of this dunya or that dunya. And then this shaitan was with each and every nation, deceiving them. So this is a very expert, very sophisticated enemy. I'm going to deceive them from the front, from the back, from the right, from the left. The Imams, that is why we have stuck to the Ahlul Bayt. We cling to the Ahlul Bayt because they give us the tafsir of verses like these. When, because they know what shaitan meant. They, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. Says when shaitan says that I'm going to deceive you from the front, he says I'm going to glorify akhirat for them. I'm going to glorify Akhirat for them. I'm sorry, I'm going to trivialize Akhirat for them. I'm going to trivialize, make the Akhirat insignificant for them. And when he says, I'm going to deceive them from the back, I'm going to glorify this dunya for them. The, the words of the Imam are Amuruhum Bijam il Male Wal Bukhul Biha Anil Hukuk. I will command them to gather wealth and then exercise bukhul when it comes to spending that wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the way of the hukuk that Allah has assigned, ascribed to that mal, the tabqa, him till a point will come that they will leave this wealth for their inheritors. So glorifying the dunya and belittling the akhirah is one of the techniques of shaitan. And when you talk to someone and they say, well, akhirat kisne dekhi hai? Wo udhar ka sauda hai, ye naqd hai. These are ways, if somebody says that, they have been deceived by shaitan in this manner. And what is the technique that the imam uses to counter this? And the prophets of Allah used to counter this. They glorify the akhirat for us and belittle the dunya for us. Agar dunya hamare nigahon mein azim ho, then we fall trapped to shaitan. We are susceptible to shaitan. You see in the movement of Imam Hussain in every station that he stopped and he descended, he talked about the dunya and how belittle this dunya, how insignificant this dunya is. He belittled this dunya saying, is and it is enough to understand the insignificance of this dunya that one of the prophets of Allah, Prophet Yahya, his head was sent in a tray to one of the sinners of Bani Israel. Belittling the dunya and glorifying the akhirah is, an, is a divine duty of the Imams. They do that so that we don't fear, fear, fall trapped to shaitan. Coming from the right hand side, that is why that, this is what I wanted to focus on. On the right hand side, this is where the shaitan deceives the mu'mineen, the mutadayyaneen. I'm going to come through, I'm going to deceive them through their religion. He can't invite you to, to drinking alcohol or killing someone. You are not going to do that. So with Mumineen and Mutadayyaneen, he uses this channel. He tampers with these sacred mafahim, sacred words, and changes its meaning. Like the definition of Zuhud. Zuhud is a sacred duty. Not an obligation though, it's voluntary. 
how do we understand zuhud people would say zuhud is something that you don't have a lot of wealth you live a simple life that is what most people understand about zuhud but that is not what zuhud truly means zuhud is not that you do not have this dunya zuhud is that you are not attached to this dunya you are not attached to this you can have everything of this dunya but yet you could be the biggest zahid in contrast to someone who has nothing of this dunya and yet he could be attached to this dunya to whatever he has tampering with the meaning of zuhud imam ali rasulullah sallam says that zuhud salli oh. Zuhud is that you do not become happy with what Allah gives you and you're not upset with what you lose. This is what Zuhud means. So if you have invested your money in stocks and the stocks skyrocket, if you're not happy about it, then you are a Zahid. If you've invested in real estate and you're in the market collapses, and you're not upset about it then you are a zahid can that really happen can we get to a state where we are not excited when we gain and we are not depressed when we lose i see heads saying no it's not possible or it's very difficult it it seems difficult but if we change our our world view it becomes very simple Let me give an example. So, if you are working at a bank, and I think I've given this example previously somewhere. If you're working at a bank as a cashier, for example, so one day a person walks in with a million rupees, and he deposits that million rupees with the bank, and you are the one who received that money and counted and deposit put it in the locker. Would you be the most happiest person that day? No. and the other day someone comes and withdraws a million rupees and leaves the bank would you be the most depressed person that day no why not because you don't consider that as your money if only we could have that world view with regards to the blessings that allah subhanahu wa taala deposits with us and then withdraws from us whenever he wishes the status of zuhud becomes reachable becomes achievable if we consider the blessings the worldly blessings the our children our wealth the fame that allah gives it is an amanat of allah subhanahu wa taala and we are entrusted with it he has given it to uh, he has given it to us today and whenever he wants he can take it back if that is how we look at this at the blessings that allah gives us then zuhud suddenly seems very easy to accomplish so it is this transformation of ideology that is needed to achieve a lot of these virtues allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad and the same goes with the other virtues that we want to accomplish we want to run after akhirah you have to value akhirat more than this dunya if we bring if we raise our children in a manner for that for them akhirat is more valuable than this dunya then they will not fall trap to shaitan another way in which shaitan deceives or has deceived us is through this concept of intezar intezar which was supposed to be one of the best actions afzal al amal is also intizar al faraj is considered to be one of the afzal tareen ba fazil al tareen actions it is an action it is not passively waiting it is actively waiting for the imam and if you look at the waiting of the imam the final imam is being waited not only by the muslims not only by the shias not only by the ahl sunnah not only by the muslims alone every 
nation is waiting for a savior. They have different names for it, but everyone is waiting for a savior. And the difference between our view and our brother's view is that we say that he will re he has been born and he will reappear. What does our brother say? He will be born. Just for the sake of an intellectual argument, if you have this belief that he will be born, so whenever you are asked, where is the Imam? Your reply would be, he will be born. If you follow that cycle, there never will be Zahur then. Because at each point in time, your Aqeedah is, he will be born. So it's, so it's like 40 years down the road now. He says Zahur is 40 years down the road. In every moment in time, that is what your Aqeedah is. So, so that is one point. We believe in the concept of Intizar. We are awaiting for the 12th Imam. And not only us, everyone is waiting for the 12th Imam. Right? And one of the problems that when this discussion of Imamat happens and we start entering into the debate on who was the rightful waris of the Holy Prophet after his death is that there are sensitivities involved and people often because of those sensitivities are not able to figure out haq from batil let us look at this problem from the other side from the 12th imam everyone is waiting for the 12th imam and we all believe all muslims believe that when the 12th imam will reappear Islam will reach its peak. All of the problems of the Muslim Ummah will be resolved. He will lead the Ummah and he will establish the rule of justice over the entire Muslim world, rather over the entire world eventually. So my suggestion and my request to our Muslim brothers is that why don't you sit down and select the 12th Imam. Why don't we appoint a 12th Imam just like you have appointed all the previous Imams? Your belief, you have believed in appointment or selection. We believe in divine appointment. But you believed in selection by the, the Ummah, the experts. So there is no limit. We are limited. We cannot choose the 12th Imam and therefore we are waiting. But there is no such restriction on the other brothers. They might as well choose the 12th Imam and put an end to the atrocities of the Muslim world. But when it comes to the 12th Imam, everyone is waiting. Why this inconsistency? We are consistent with our belief when it came to the 12th we are waiting for the 12th by divine appointment. We waited for the 11th Imam by through divine appointment. We believed in the 10th Imam through divine appointment, the 9th and the 8th and the 7th and the 6th, all the way till the 1st. But you believed in selection by the Ummah all the way till the 11th. What suddenly changed now? What suddenly changed? The twelfth Imam cannot be chosen by the people. Everyone is waiting for divine appointment for the twelfth Imam to come. And this throws light on the methodology of appointment of the previous Imams as well. Please recite the salawat. When the twelfth will reappear, he will fill the world with justice. And when he will appear, there will be an uprising. And that is what we need to prepare for. There's a lot, there are a lot of similarities between the movement of Imam Musa and 
and the movement of the 12th Imam. They both did Qiyam. When the 12th Imam is going to come, we should be anticipating another Qiyam and we should be preparing ourselves for that eventual Qiyam. Inshallah, tomorrow I will I'll read a book in the beautiful hadith in which a person came to the Imam and he said that we have not been blessed, we are not living in the time of the 12th Imam. Just like the questions by people that we live in the time of Ghaibah, we do not have access to the Imam. Why are we at loss? We were not in the time of the Holy Prophet, nor did we see the time of the Imams. We feel ourselves at loss. How did the Imam reply? Inshallah, we'll, we'll, if God allows, we'll talk about that tomorrow. For us to be the true soldiers of our 12th Imam, the true Ansar, the true helpers of the 12th Imam, we need to change our worldview in a view in a way that this dunya is insignificant in our eyes and akhirat is more significant. And the Imam did the tarbiyat of his companions and his Ahlul Bayt in precisely that manner. On the night of Ashur, when he gathered his companions, he gave them a choice at that point. He wanted everyone who wanted to sacrifice himself on the day of Ashur to be out of free will, complete free will, and not because of any prayer obligation that they have locked themselves into. He called his companions and announced, we the people of household do not deceive nor trick. We do not deceive nor trick. They are after my life. It is my blood that they need. They are not after you. Take advantage of the darkness of the night and leave. But nobody was ready to leave. Thinking that maybe some of them are ashamed to leave. He makes it easier for them to leave by saying, if you don't want to save your lives, Hold the hands of one of my family members and take them with you. Maybe somebody might use this opportunity to save his life. He gives them a final third reason to leave. I free you of my allegiance, of oath of allegiance. The lights were turned off. If you want to leave, leave. Maybe they're afraid, they're ashamed of to leave in front of others. But nobody left. When the lights were turned on, they were all there. And the Imam saying, I do not know of companions better than my companions. And I do not know of the Ahl al-Bayt better than my holy household. They truly were loyal companions. And then one after the other, they stood up to express their loyalty on the night of Ashur. The first among them was Hadrat Abbas Then Muslim bin Ausajai, then others with strange remarks. One of them said, should we leave you only to be eaten by the wild beasts of the desert? No. We'll never leave you. Another said, hey, this is only one life that I am sacrificing for you. If Allah gives me 70 lives and each time I am killed and my body is burnt into ashes and the ashes spread in thin air and I, give, I am given life again, I will again Sacrifice my life in your defense. These are the companions of Imam Hussein. And the Imam Hussein praised them and told them that in that case, all of you will be killed tomorrow. No one will live. Everyone will be killed. And they were delighted and excited. But from one corner, there was this child who was listening to this discussion. He turned to his Imam as if he has a question to ask. Only 13 years of age, worried, it is possible that because of my tender age, I might not get the permission to fight. He turns to the Imam, Anafi man yuqtal, O Imam, is my name in the list of the martyrs? Am I going to be killed tomorrow? 
before the imam answered him the imam asked another question to him to show to the world the marifa of the ahlul bayt of his holy household he asked him kayf al maut indak qasim how do you see maut how do you see death and the reply came ahla min al asal sweeter than honey sweeter than honey death and akhirah for the ahlul bayt is more significant is glorified is glorious for them these are the children of ahlul bayt what to talk about the seniors of ahlul bayt and the elders of ahlul bayt ahla min al asal then he repeats his question oh uncle will i be killed tomorrow the imam replied qasim you're asking about yourself even my al yasghar will be killed tomorrow even my al yasghar will be killed when everybody heard of the shahada of al yasghar they were surprised and they were they started to mourn and they started to cry are the ashkia going to enter the tents and kill al yasghar the imam replied this is not how al yasghar will be killed rather i will take him in my hands before the ashkia and then on the night of ashur it is narrated that imam hussein narrated the entire incident of the shahada of al yasghar on that very night in a manner that the imam was crying and the ashab was crying everybody was crying like to ask and think and i invite you to think when imam was crying in such a manner when he was narrating the story of shahada of ali asghar what would imam state be when he was actually taking ali asghar into the field us waqt imam ki kya halat hogi jab asghar ko maidan mein le ja rahe the on the day of ashur the loyal companions fulfilled their promise to defend the imam one after the other till a time came that the imam saw hazrat qasim standing in front of him looking at his imam seeking permission to go to the battlefield it is said that the imam did not give him permission instantaneously even though he had informed him the previous night that you will be killed but the permission is not given there are many reasons to explain why one of the reasons that some of the urafa has given is that one of the purposes of the imam is to help every individual reach its perfection qasim because of his tender age there were still more potential in qasim so the imam refused and qasim began to insist with every insistence that i want to achieve martyrdom in your defense his level was raising har ishtiaq har shauq ke mujhe shahadat chahiye unke darje ko buland kar rahi thi till a time came that he reached his full potential and the imam then gave him the permission to enter the battlefield qasim was only 13 years old the, there was no armor that could fit his body the other companions when they went into the battlefield they were they had the armor they had the shields and they had the helmet and the other armor when when qasim went into the battlefield he was dressed by his uncle his helmet was the imama that the holy imam tore into half and used half of it and wound it on his head then he gave the, the other half was wrapped around his body in the form of a kafan and when qasim began to walk towards the battlefield his sword was dragging was hitting touching the ground and he was marking his road to martyrdom when he entered the battlefield the enemy saw that tears were rolling down his cheek one of the warriors came forward and said why are you crying o child warriors don't cry in the battlefield he turned to him and said i am not crying over what will happen to me i am crying over what is happening to my imam then he introduced himself saying in tun kiruni fana ibn al hasan if you do not know me then know that i am the son of hasan siptun nabi al mustafa wal mu'taman who hasan who was the grandson of the holy prophet who was the trusty of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala haza husainun haza husainun kal asir al murtahan and this is husain alayhi salam who is trapped between you like a prisoner 
you people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not shower his rain of mercy on you ever then he entered into battle into duels with the enemy one after the enemy one after the other whoever came to attack him was killed by Qasim until Hamid ibn Muslim narrates that one of the warriors was sitting next to me and he said I am going to go and challenge this child and I said to him he's only a child if this child was to invite me to battle I would not accept his request because he is a child let someone else go and fight him but he did not listen and he entered the battlefield now janab Qasim is only a child and this is a warrior a fierce battle took place between the two and after a little while janab Qasim got struck on his head and he fell from the horse and when he fell from the horse he cried to his uncle saying ya amma adrikni oh my uncle come to my rescue Mere chacha, meri madad ko aye. the Imam Hussain salam came to his rescue when it is narrated that Imam came to the body of Qasim just like an eagle dives at its prey when Imam came to Ali Akbar it is said that one of the statements that Imam Hussain said was ala dunya ba'daka al-ifa Akbar tere baad ab jine par khak Imam on every shaheed had a different statement to make but when he came close to janab Qasim he approached Janab Qasim just like an eagle dives at his prey. The enemy was about to behead Janab Qasim, but the Imam got there in time, and a battle, a fight took place between the Imam and this enemy soldier. And the Imam chopped off his hands, and when his hands were chopped off, he screamed loudly and cried for help help all the enemy soldiers converged at this enemy at this enemy soldier to defend him from the Imam and as a result there was dust everywhere nobody knew what happened where when the horses of the right trampled and left to the moved to the left and the horses from the left moved to the right when the dust settled and the scene became clear it was seen that Imam Hussain wasalam, was sitting next to Janab Qasim and he was saying repeating this sentence he was saying Qasim it is very hard on your uncle that you call your uncle for help but your uncle is not able to help you your uncle is not able to reach you in time and even if he reaches you he is not he is of no use to do to you to do on that day then he reads his musiba saying that Qasim today is the day when your uncle's enemy are many and his helpers are only a few Allah lanatullahi ala al-qawmi al-zalimeen pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accepts this recitation and your hearing and he hastens the reappearance of our 12th Imam Matam ya Hussain of all Hussain least of all Hussain least of all Hussain least of all Hussain on the pieces of Qasim they cried For no one could bear that he died On the pieces of Qasim they cried For no one could bear that he died Least of all Hussain Least of all Hussain Everyone! Least of all, Hussain. Least, Least of all, 
least of all who sin, least of all who sin, carry cross, least of all who sin. O lovers of Hassan, come near, as I narrate to you his dear. He was left to defend the Imam and to protect the deen of Islam. He was left to defend the Imam and to protect the deen of Islam. So Qasim approaches Hussein in a moment of tremendous pain. The rose of her son has to fight, but how can Hussein risk his light? The rose of her son has to fight, but how can Hussein risk his light? On the pieces of Qasim they cried, everyone, for no one could bear that he died. Least of all who sin, least of all who sin, least of all who sin, least of all who sin. He was of his brother a trust, who sin could not see him in dust. O Qasim, my son, take a breath. I ask you, how do you view death? O Qasim, my son, take a breath. I ask you, how do you view death? His answer we must always keep. His answer cause dangers to weep. You know, uncle, I love honey, but death is sweeter than honey. You know, uncle, I love honey, but death is sweeter than honey. On the pieces of Qasim they cried, for no one could bear that he died. Everyone! Least of all who sin, least of all who sin, least of all who sin, least of all who sin. Said Mola O Qasim, my pride, for women you must stay behind. So Qasim goes back to his camp, his face full of tears and so damp. So Qasim goes back to his camp, his face full of tears and so damp. His mother said, why do you cry? He said, for Hussein I can die. Um Farwa pulled out a letter, hoping that this would make things better. Um Farwa pulled out a letter, hoping that this would make things better. When Mola saw who it was from, his entire body went numb. He had to let Qasim go fight. The young nephew's face became bright. He had to let Qasim go fight. The young nephew's face became bright. Hussein gave him turban and cloak. Seeing him lady then a broke. To aunties and mothers farewell, to aunties and mother farewell, as Qasim comes out of his shell. To aunties and mother farewell, as Qasim comes out of his shell. On the pieces of Qasim they cried, 
for no one could bear that he died. Least of all who said, everyone, least of all who said, least of all who said, least of all who said. The lion of Hassan so brave, he sent thirty-five to the grave. Then Qasim, his armor so large, so cowardly enemies charge. They struck Qasim from every side. Oh, uncle, help me, Qasim cried. They ripped his young body apart and struck right at his uncle's heart. They ripped his young body apart and struck right at his uncle's heart. O oh, Qasim, your call is still loud. We always want to make you proud. O oh, Qasim, your call is still loud. We always want to make you proud. On the pieces of Qasim they cried, for no one could bear that he died. Least of all who said, least of all who said, least of all who said, everyone, least of all who said, least of all who said, least of all who said. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.